Hey everyone, it's Alex Ball with another episode of the No-Till Martyr Garden Podcast. On today's show, we sit down with Matt and Nina Ladergaard of Groundstone Farm and Squash Blossom Local Food located in northern New Mexico. We dig deep on growing no-till veg in a high desert, community water access, and operate a local food distribution business. Today's episode of the No-Till Market Garden Podcast is brought to you by Orisha. Orisha is a greenhouse automation company whose mission is to make agriculture more ecological and productive through advanced technology. Orisha automates all temperature, humidity, and irrigation management systems. Their products are designed to be instinctive, easy to install, and wireless, and their remote management application allows growers to save time. In addition, the integration of AI in their programs offers more precision and better control over the various factors influencing the environment inside your greenhouse. Last thing, Orisha wants to help market gardeners optimize their yields. Automating allows a better quality of life, can save several weeks of labor costs, and saves nearly 20% in energy costs. Listeners can use the promo code no till grower. That's three words, no till grower, to get 15% off your order. Check them out at orisha.io. That's O R I S H A dot I O. Today's episode is also brought to you by Rimmel Greenhouses. Whether it's tomatoes to market, flowers in the spring, or your family's harvest, growing in a greenhouse protected from the weather provides the right environment that you need for a harvest that you can count on. Rimmel Greenhouses are designed for durability and offer the quality that you need to grow productively year-round. Visit RimmelGreenhouses.com to get a quote today. If I may editorialize for a second, I own a Rimmel tunnel. I love it. We built it ourselves, and I really appreciated the quality of the tunnel as well as the customer service we received in the process. So make sure to check them out. All right. Enjoy the show. Well, Matt, I'm so excited to have you uh, with us today. So maybe we can just start and jump right into it and learn more about your farm. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. It's a, an honor to be here and um, privileged to be on the podcast. And yeah, so yeah, my name is Matt Ladegard and um, the owner, operator of Groundstone Farm in um, Nambe, New Mexico, which is just 20 miles north of Santa Fe, New Mexico. We're on a five acre property, but it's really only about three quarters in production of, of vegetables. And um, about a quarter of it is in tunnels of different types, caterpillar tunnels and high tunnels. You know, I was kind of like doing some math before the interview and it's it's a funny property where it's it's five acres, but these these little terraces and there's these little plots that I've kind of squeezed out of this land. But if you're at all condensed it into, you know, put them all butt butt to butt next to each other, it'd be a 300 by 15 foot by 100 foot plot. So it's about three quarters of an acre. OK, OK. Um, and maybe for folks who don't know, uh, what's the environment like where you're farming is you say. I mean, you mentioned earlier, you're pretty high elevation. Yeah, so we're in the high desert of New Mexico, and um, we're at, we're at 6,000 feet, and just 20 minutes north of us in Santa Fe is 7,000 feet. We're 6A, zone, uh, USDA zone, I believe, and um, we're kind of on the edge, so we're kind of in a lush river valley, surrounded by red rock badlands, kind of like what you think of as like a high desert environment. Um, we look up against the Sangre de Cristo Mountains, which um, collect snowfall, co- you know, connects, collect snow in the winter. And that's where we get the source of our irrigation water from. We're kind of in this really unique environment where we're in a, kind of a lush river river valley. But if you drive five minutes either direction, you're just looking at red rocks. And, you know, um, we get snow in the winter, we get cold, but we're dry and we only get eight to 12 inches of precipitation a year on average. Wow. And last year, last year was a good year and we got 14 inches. <laughs> wow. That's an intense heat. It's an intense uh, lack of moisture there. Yeah. And that's, that's, you know, there's a saying here, um, agua, la agua es vida. And it's literally like water is life here. You know, it's, it's kind of an advantage um, for a farmer in some ways, if you have the source of water. So when we get into a little bit of the production side, like when you need to add water, you can add water, but you can never take away water. You know what I mean? Like we run a pretty intense secession crop planning throughout the summer and we're planting, you know, basically every, every Wednesday we're transplanting and that's my only day to transplant with my crews here. So that's Wednesdays. And, you know, 
to do the field prep and everything when it's dry is really easy. And then you just lay out the drip tapes and you add water and there you go. But um, like last year we got some rains and it kind of threw me off because the soil was too wet to, um, to cultivate, to harrow and kind of threw me for a loop. So it's kind of advantage if you have the water to be able to add the water because you can never take it away, you know? Yeah. So you're saying you're in this river Valley. How long have you been on this land for? And were there other, with a lot of producers in the area who've been there in this river valley before you? Um, so the longer context is that, you know, the Southwest is the oldest um, agricultural lands in the United, in the continent of the United States. You know, people have been here for thousands of years farming and um, we're surrounded by the, a bunch of Pueblos, the uh, Native, Amer Native American reservations that are just on um, either side of us. And um, so the, the Pueblos here, and then there are, they've been here for thousands of years farming. And then we have a, a community, large Hispanic community that um, descended from, you know, the Spanish that came four or 500 years ago. And they've been, so there's a lot of history of cultivation and growing of, of, of crops out here. And then of course, when we get into like, you know, what we're doing of the small scale, you know, vegetable um, for market, specialty products um there is a few you know there's definitely there's definitely growers out here um and there's a bunch of different lush river valleys out here probably within an hour of us and there's probably one or two you know vegetable growers in each river in each river valley and most of us sell at the santa fe farmers market okay and how far is that market for, uh, from your farm uh i can get there in 18 minutes oh wow um, if i'm cruising yeah. <laughs> Nice. So you're pretty close to, to, <laughs> if to market. If I'm, a little late, if I'm a little late in the morning on Saturday morning, that's, yeah, I can get there in 18 minutes. <laughs> I like, not 20 minutes, 18. You got it down. Yeah, I, I timed it. <laughs> I like that. So how long have you been at this current farm property for? So uh, we've been here for, um, this is going on, so we got the property in 2019. I cover cropped it in 2020 and then 21, 22, and 23. So that's going on three years on this farm property. Before that, I farmed for three years, just literally five minutes away from here across the river at um, a lease, just some uh, some raw land that I leased. And um, and that was a totally different experience. That was raw land. It didn't have a well, didn't have any electricity. I was living in Santa Fe at the time. I was commute farming. That was a real, um, you know, school of hard knocks. And it was great. And, you know, the, the land I leased was essentially for free. And it was a great learning opportunity, um, but I don't know how people can do that. Yeah, yeah, you really need to find that more stable system that allows you to really invest in yourself and in the property. Yeah, investing in the property and investing in the soil and um, not burning yourself out and you know all those different things. So you're saying you're not, not too far from you know, a major city. Is the area you're in like, uh, like heavily rural or is it kind of like a middle area transitioning towards more rural spaces? It's definitely rural. Um, I mean, city of Santa Fe is, yeah, the city of Santa Fe is 88,000 people. So it's, a, you know, mid-sized city, um, but definitely very small in terms of things. And, um, you know, the population in New Mexico is very little. Gotcha. Gotcha. So it's, mainly rural. it's mainly rural. It kind of, um, you know, there's a lot of, like I was saying, there's a lot of history of just people living out here that, you know, have goats or have sheep or they have a little garden. You know, it's funny. Most of my neighbors have tractors, Kubota tractors, John Deere tractors, and, you know, they, you know, uh, flood their pastures with them. And most people have, you know, one to two acre plots of land. And most of my neighbors have tractors and I don't have a tractor and I'm the one, <laughs> and I'm the one living off the land, but that's how it goes. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally know how that goes. Um, so you mentioned earlier yeah. that Wednesday is your uh, your crew day. So how many folks are working on your farm right now? Uh, it depends on the year. Um, this year I've this year I have four employees that are two days a week, and some of that's changing. I had I've had an awesome employee who's been with me for three years, and he's leaving in May. Then I got. And he's with me three days a week. I got somebody coming for the summers two days a week. So it, it you know, it varies. Um, but it's probably the equivalent of one full-time person, I'd, I'd say. Okay. So you have the, the amidst of part-time labor. I, 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 probably a tad bit more um, than the equivalent of a full-time person. So yeah. And then you're on the farm full-time as well. 
I'm on the farm full time. Um, you know, it changes every year. Last year we had a baby and that was, that was awesome. And that, you know, switches things up a little bit this year. I'm kind of going the approach where I have, you know, a lot of people on Mondays, Wednesdays and Thursdays, and then condensing, condensing all the work into those days. And then I'm only, the farm is only, you know, how do I put this? The farm is only like getting worked on four days a week. So the farm is basically operating on four days a week. You know, Fridays I'm by myself and I kind of putz around and do like the managerial things I need to do. And then Saturdays I'm at the farmer's market. And so, um, yeah, like work days on the farm are only four days a week right now. Nice. And I kind of like, I kind of like that. And we, we just do, you know, eight hour days and pretty much it's always eight hours unless, you know, we're just trying to finish something up. Um, but it's kind of nice to just have that feeling. Yeah, yeah, to have kind of like an end to the day because we all know you can work for en- endlessly uh, on a farm. Yeah, and and of course, like I am the owner, and so I'm always opening things up. You know, in the mornings, I'm closing things up at night. I'm running irrigation when people aren't here. Like, there's always I'm watering the greenhouses. There's always things, so it's always a, it's always a, uh, as everyone knows, it's a very hands-on business. But in terms of like, yeah, the work days is only really four days on the farm. Yeah, I, I don't know about you, but I feel like really, if you want to do this the rest of our lives, we have to find a stable system that will allow us to continue mm-hmm. doing this day in, day out. Is, we can't do 20 hours you know, a day for 40 years. It, we, we, won't, we won't make it. Yeah, totally. And I did that my first four or five years where you know I was working 70 hour days and I was commuting and I was it was just, you know, and it, it was just kind of it was awesome and it was really fun and it was exhilarating and it was really exhausting. And, um, but it was, it couldn't, it couldn't, you know, I can't do that for that long. Yeah, for sure. And you mentioned earlier that you're in sit say, uh, how long are you usually coming to market or producing crops uh, at your property? So this year was, um, so usually I consider the outdoor field production, you know, we start planting in March outside and probably mid March. And then we can, pull off harvesting crops, you know, um, till Thanksgiving outside, depending on the year. Towards the beginning of November, it starts to get really cold and you start to get those like teen, you know, get in the teens and, you know, but somehow those bok choy survive out there with two layers of row cover and they look good. And then we have the tunnels and, um, you know, what we do with the tunnels is we start planting in them early. I like the strategy where I'll start planting in them early for like longer season crops. And then, um, so when the markets come on, cause I only do markets April through Thanksgiving, pretty much the, the farmer's markets. So I use the tunnels to just get planted early and have like, um, nicer crops early on. And then we'll, this year was different where we were actually harvesting every week of the year, other than, you know, the three or four weeks we took off for the holidays, um, and this winter we are harvesting greens every week for squash blossom, um, our family, our, my wife and our family business. Wow. So it's a pretty much a year on operation. Yeah. So we were doing wholesale all winter, um, which was really nice. I, you know, there are a lot of farmers that do the winter markets and, you know, the winter markets, maybe I could make more money, but it's kind of that same thing where I really like just you know, working a day and then putting the the food in the coolers and then that's it, you know, because when you start to tally up all the time of loading up your truck and setting up a market and standing there and, you know, breaking down the market, you know, it really adds up. Yeah, yeah. And also your market display is beautiful. The photos are fantastic. So folks check, them, check those out. I can see that. That's a lot, a lot of work into that. Yeah, I appreciate it. And yeah, it takes, I mean, it's not so much physical for me. It's just kind of emotional. And um yeah, it's just, I really like to be on for the season. And then, you know, when it's, when it's not on, I just kind of like to, <laughs> to, yeah, kind of, kind of sell to our other outlets. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And you were saying that like in, you said you're here in teens, low teens in early November, what's it like, let's say December, January, February, are, are you staying like, you know, under 20 degrees during the during the day at night? How's the weather, especially the, the high elevation? Yeah. I mean, it changed, you know, every year is different, but um, we're definitely getting in the single digits and teens, maybe the twenties every night. And then, you know, in, in January, February, and then the days are usually in the forties. 30s to 40s if it's a warm if it's a warm spell 50s 
Um, unusual would be in the low 60s. It's very unusual, and that would be very concerning, but it happens. And then, um, you know, it starts to starts to climb back up in about March. But then we'll, yeah, but we'll still we'll still have those, um, you know, teen nights in March and even in April. And, you know, you have you started planting and you have crops out in the field with just one single layer of row cover and they survive. You know, we're not we're, we're planting all the frost hardy greens out there and they're getting a lot of solar gain in the day. Um, so yeah, are, are are you are you studying those cold temps after you plant it in your summer crops? Is there any like risk of losing those as you you know those those lower nights? So I I push it really, I push it probably earlier than I should with a few things, but I haven't had a loss of frost in a while, um, and I'm pretty conservative with you know protection. I'm a little bit anal with like, Oh, did I, did I, did I make sure the corners of that row cover and that high tunnel were completely covered? And it's so all like, go back down to the greenhouse and double check things. And yeah, I don't um, know. we probably plant, we start planting summer. We don't plant summer crops in the tunnels till about April, um, end of March, April. So. And I guess that speaks to the, to the power of the intensity of the sun you have there and the solar gain of those tunnels to be able to capture that heat. Yep. So that's the sun is really what we're trying to take advantage of. It'll really warm up the soil, especially early, you know, in February, we'll close all the tunnels up and try and get that soil temperature above, you know, 45, 50 degrees. And then just, yeah, we'll try and try and warm up that soil and then, you know, still get really cold in the tunnel. Um, but using that radiant heat with row covers, we can really pull off a lot. That's super impressive that you can do all that, especially in such an intense, uh, uh, weather you have there. Yeah. And like, I've thought of, you know, getting propane heaters and, you know, oh, it's always so nice to have a heater. And, um, I just, yeah, I just haven't done it. And I don't know if I will. <laughs> no, I, I totally agree with you. There's one of the things for me is like, it feels like it, it'd be so nice to keep things like, you know, just at 35, no right below freezing. Exactly. But I yeah, feel yeah, like, yeah. I don't know. I feel like I, it'd be a slippery slope. And I, I, I feel like just keep touching higher and higher. And eventually. Yeah. I, I mean, I've definitely, it's my nursery really where, um, you know, I'll have some losses sometimes, you know, on a really cold night in February, I plant some things that aren't that cold hardy. Or I find that, seeds um plants are really vulnerable right at that germination stage so lettuces for example like we can we can germinate them if we germinate them and they're right where that that seed is right, right where the life is emerging from the seed and then you get a night under let's say 20 degrees then that's where your loss is but if you were able to protect it just for a few more days where the the, the cotyledons are able to come up out of the potting soil um, then that, that lettuce, I mean, that can handle down to the, yeah, I don't know, teens or something and, and be fine. Yeah. Yeah. I want to get past that, that, that vulnerable stage. Yeah. And so it's just like learning all those tricks and I'm definitely, definitely an expensive thing to learn. Yeah. But it's a lesson you, you learn once or twice and then it doesn't yep. happen again usually. Yep. Totally. Uh, so maybe we rewind a little bit. You're saying earlier uh, that you know you do a little bit of wholesale, um, farmers markets. What's kind of the breakdown uh, of the of your product product distribution? Yeah, sure. So um, I'd probably say half of like the the volume of products, or half of half of the products probably go to wholesale. So I sell to Squash Blossom Local Food, which we'll get into uh, a local co-op. There's a local CSA that the farmers market the farmers market runs, and um, you know there's some chefs that reach out to me, and I'll do direct sales to them too. But uh, with sales, it's probably quarter to a third of sales is wholesale, and the rest is the farmers market. Okay, so a lot of growth at the market. Yeah, and uh, we sell only at the Santa Fe farmers market on Saturdays, and there's a Tuesday market too. And the Santa Fe farmers market is just an amazing farmers market for farmers, for um, for customers. I mean, there are a lot of you know there are a lot of tourists that just kind of come and just you know you know just don't really buy anything. Um, but it's a really great vibe, and um, there are a lot of. I mean, primarily my business is just supported by local customers really dedicated customers that come every week or almost every week. And they're there, you know, first thing in the morning. And um, it's an amazing market because it only, um, you can only sell there if you grow, you can only sell what you grow. 
And there are some value added products, like there's some people that bake bread and there's some people, you know, that do other, other value added stuff like that. But the rules are very strict. I don't know the exact rules for the value added, but you know, if you're, if you're baking bread, 90% of your ingredients have to come from local flours and stuff like that. So there's really no reselling. There is no reselling and it makes for a very, um, yeah, just a very awesome market, a very, very cool place to go to. And sometimes it can be challenging because, you know, you go in the spring and everybody has greens and radishes and that's pretty much it. Um, people are like, where are the tomatoes? I'm like, well, it's, you know, it's only March or April or May or whatever. Yeah, it's a cool, it's a cool farmer's market. It sounds like it's, it's in only been 18 minutes from your house. That's not too bad of a, of a drive to get out there and, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and so. Well, I'm, I'm fortunate. There are definitely farmers that come from an hour, or two hours, and sometimes three hours away. So I'm fortunate in that regard. Wow. So it sounds like a big, a fairly large market then if people are coming that far to sell to. Yeah. And another thing I was going to say is the, um, so New Mexico is kind of, you know, we're in Northern New Mexico. So we're above Santa Fe. And then below Santa Fe, there's Albuquerque and, you know, it gets, gets warmer. And um, so the farmer's market only accepts vendors from the Northern counties above Santa Fe, um, above Santa Fe County. There's some exemptions for, you know, if, um, you know, there's a person who brings pomegranates in the fall because we can't grow pomegranates up here. And so they make exemptions for either products that people don't currently sell and grow, grow and sell um, or things like that. But it, it makes it for, yeah, a great market. It sounds like a very well run and managed market. Is it who's it run by? So it's run by, you know, I don't know all the exact details. I'm kind of like, I'm the farmer in the field. I don't know like all the exact details, but there is an institute that support the Santa Fe Farmers Market Institute that supports the Santa Fe Farmers Market. And then there are um, you know, their executive directors, but then the, the market is run by a uh, market manager. And we had a great market manager for a few years and there's a new one. I haven't met him yet. My second, my second spring market is um, it's next week. So I haven't met him yet, but he seems pretty good. Well, that's good. I'm glad you have a great place, a place where you feel home and tell your product for. Yeah. And I think the market manager is part in any, you know, in any market, but especially here, a lot of the vendors at the market are um, Hispanic. Um, and so, you know, you got to be bilingual, you have to deal with a lot of different, you have to just deal with a lot of different people in general, but then you got to be bilingual. It's a hard job. Yeah. So yeah, it is a hard job. And, and every market I've ever worked at, you know, you're trying to balance the, the, the needs of so many different people, not only the community, yeah. people, your, your, your people who, who, who pay your salary, and also the vendors as well. So there's a lot of players to balance at once. Absolutely. So you're saying you sell a lot to squash blossom. I'd love to know about that, the history of that, uh, of that, of that food business. You know, you want to come over here? She's going to come over. Oh, I'd love that. Hi. <laughs> Hi, I'm Alex. Nice to meet you. Um, we love your podcast. <laughs> oh, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to chat with me. I, uh, when, I, when Matt sent me about squash blossom, I looked at your website. I'm like, Oh, what a cool business. I have to know more about this. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Well, it's, it's basically a multi-farm kind of CSA for lack of a better term. I call it a subscription service um, because we don't ask for money up front to cover the cost of seeds. People just subscribe and pay as they go. Um, and so customers can choose their um, frequency of orders and they can get a bag every week or um, every other week or once a month. And we work with um, about 25 farms in the, in the area. And it actually started as um, direct sales to restaurants. And then we added the subscription service, um, the retail service later. But so we work with about, we worked with about 30 restaurants before COVID. And now we're we're getting back up there in that in the double digits. Um, but of course at COVID, all of the restaurant sales halted. And then our, there was a lot more demand for our um for the retail subscription. Okay. So so you're, you're doing direct so uh Direct to, far, direct, direct, to, direct to restaurant and also do direct to, to consumer as well. Um, yes, exactly. Yeah. So Squash Blossom started with, um, rest, sorry, I was just pointing at our baby. I think uh, my parents might need help. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so it started with, uh, as a way, it was, we called it farm to restaurant and it was just an experiment of um, trying to get more local food in Santa Fe's restaurant scene because while Santa Fe is a really small town, like Matt was telling you, it has a phenomenal restaurant scene. We have so many um, independently owned businesses, um, incredible chefs, a wide variety of 
cuisines. And um, so we were working in like, I guess I started all this around like 2010 and we were working to um, get food, just like bulk from the farm to the restaurants, not seconds after the farmer's market, but first and do um, production planning with the chefs and farmers so that we could reduce waste and um, and just move things in bulk. Yeah. So h- how are you aggregating and like managing all this? Do you have like a warehouse facility where you can handle all this product? Yeah. So what we did is um, it's been really bootstrapped. Um, I built a cool bot and well, first we started by mapping all of the cold storage like in Santa Fe that we could think of and partnering with organizations. And so it was a hustle. Like this whole time, it's just been It's been a hustle. um, And I tried not to go in with a lot of like um, startup costs. And so it's just been like, hey, can I use, you know, some of the farmer's market walk in, some of the juice businesses walk in, some of the, you know, um, kitchen up at the um, community college and, (laughs) you know, some of their walk in. And so we mapped it all out and then had farmers dropping off at different places. And then um, after a while, I was like, okay, it's time to build our own cool bot. And so then we built one in a trailer, um, which is great. So it's mobile. And then um, and then after a few years, built another one. And so now we have this aggregation spot in Santa Fe where everyone delivers to and it's two large cool bots um, and all of our farmers deliver there. But I think one of the strengths of the businesses is that it we did bootstrap it and it doesn't have huge expenses, you know, overhead expenses. Right. It's really an information exchange more than a um anything else you know so it's it's really about like me communicating with all the farmers with all the chefs and then all of our um all of our wholesale and all of our retail bags it's all on a website it's everyone purchases online um and then it's just me in the background with excel spreadsheets and stuff and and for the farmer perspective i think it's really great because um you know for me i just like to be on the field and i don't necessarily want to communicate with a bunch of chefs and they all have different you know some of them text some of them email and so what i do with nina is just say hey i have a lot of this on can you list it on your uh your on your on your for your chefs and then <clears throat> so they'll be on their on their website and the chefs can just order all of what i have and um also if i say you know i have a lot of this can you split can can you put it in your in your blossom bags and you know so it's really great from the farmer perspective as well where i can sell a whole lot of stuff and i don't have to have i'm basically giving you all the communication to deal with (laughs) yeah it's a one it's a one thing like uh, all the farmers just communicate with me they tell me their availability and i decide what goes we call them blossom bags for the subscribers um, so I decide what goes in the bags each week, um, usually around like five items um, from various farms. And then for the chefs, yeah, so Matt just said, Nina, I have unlimited salad mix. And then I decide who gets what and where it all goes, you know. And then with my other farmers, um, if like a few people have butternuts on at the same time, I just try and be diplomatic and like rotate um you know, give different people orders so that everyone can move their product, everyone's getting a reliable income stream. Um things like that. And then for chefs in the same breath, um, it's one stop shop too. So they get one delivery, one invoice, and it's from 25 farms. Wow. What a great business model. Nina, how do you, how do you come up with this? And uh, what was the origins of this? How, how do you get this started? Well, so I was working in the nonprofit sector, um, doing like farm advocacy work. And that's when we piloted this um, farmer chef like meetings and trying to get like a wholesale price list and trying to do production planning. And then we did like a pilot of um, distribution and it was just like me renting a van and and delivering everywhere. And then, um, and then it became very transactional after a couple of years. And then we realized, Oh, this is a business. Um, This is no longer just like a nonprofit um, experiment. And so then I left the nonprofit realm, but I, uh, I'm still mission driven. And so we're a social enterprise and, um, and our mission is to provide a reliable income stream to local farmers, bring healthy food to our community and strengthen our local economy. And so I'm still mission driven, but now all we do is, you know, move produce. And, and uh, so it started with the wholesale, we added the retail. And like I said, it used to be primarily wholesale, a little retail, then it's switched in the pandemic. And now things are coming back into balance um, where I'm adding more restaurants and trying to keep that volume high with the retail. So uh, the pandemic really showed us what we're capable of um, because so many of our industrial um, supply chains fell apart. Um, and so we had to just 
rise to the occasion. And then we were able to really feed our community a lot of local food. And it was very empowering to just realize what we're capable of. Um, so now we're trying to stay operating at that level. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. And, and you said this Blossom Bag, which is a great name, by the way. I love Blossom Bag. That's so good. Uh, <laughs> are those uh, home deliveries? Is it pickup locations? How do you manage that? Yeah, so I'm a big fan of partnering with other local businesses in our community and sharing resources, like I mentioned, um, with the cold storage. And so we actually have eight pickup locations that are small local businesses, which when our customers come to pick up their Blossom bag, they're bringing in foot traffic to these businesses. Hopefully they're grabbing a coffee or a pastry or a pizza or what have you, um, depending on which business it is. And um, one of the pickup spots is our farm. We have a farm stand with yet another cool bot um, where customers can come pick up their bags. And then we also offer home delivery. Home I, delivery was kind of the COVID. Yeah, COVID. we added that during COVID. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I love the ability that you've been able to leverage and like piggyback all this existing infrastructure instead of, like, instead of first thing, building it yourself, like, you know, partner with other people and, you know, use things that are already, uh, already in existence. Yeah, you get really creative when you don't have when you're afraid of debt and um, <laughs> when you don't have a lot of extra resources, you just start thinking, well, what's already here? So I don't have to reinvent the wheel, you know, um, and I think being uh, in the nonprofit sector it taught me how to be um, scrappy and partner. And, you know, I mean, there's just so much strength when we work together and we're all trying to and there's so many underutilized facilities, you know, I mean, I think about that all the time. Um, so the more we can work together than like the the less risk for all of our businesses. I, I totally agree. I, I did. I have a pit up rotation at a little, little, little food co-op and a little food business. And the same thing, they, they love just the added traffic that just pulled in by people coming to their shares and also the optics of just having a sign that says, you know, anything food or farm related, pick up here. It makes them look good in the community. And, you know, it can always just bring a little more, uh, a little more goodwill and traffic. And you know, they always love that. Absolutely. Yeah. This is a super cool business. So how many of these bags are you doing weekly? It's about a hundred. Um, yeah, we're we're like right around a hundred here. Uh, we had a boost um, at the beginning of the pandemic. We went up to two fifty, which was the biggest we ever were. And then, um, yeah, of course, it was like in March. We we're like, I yeah. have, I have a. <laughs> we were like, what do we feed all these new people that have like never had local food before? And like, here's your, yeah, storage crops. But um. But yeah, and then it kind of found its right size at around 100. That's super cool. And it's nice that you've been able to scale it from you know, kind of smaller scale, work with other people, trailer, trailer, and then now full facility that you're you're working out of. That's that's fantastic. I, I, now I want to see this now. It sounds amazing. Yeah, I will come on by. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I hope folks go and learn more about this, uh, about Squash Blossom. Um, so it seems like a really, a really cool model that we need more of. And I tell people all the time, I feel like we, we always need more intermediate, intermediate, intermediate businesses that are helping connect farmers with that, the end consumer. Yeah, um, right. You. And like also from like a family perspective. So Nina started this, had this business before, you know, we met and, um, you know, I've, we've had those conversations sometimes we're like, why don't we just combine businesses and be, you know, a CSA and then the Groundstone Farm will have a CSA. But it's actually, it's really nice to be able to leverage like there are other farmers that grow things that Groundstone Farm can't grow or doesn't want to grow. And so to be able to, you know, offer those items and from like a risk standpoint, you know, if we get a huge hailstorm on the farm, um, then like we still have, you know, another business that we can support, you know, we can give our customers like things that other farmers are growing and um, it's been kind of nice. Well, yeah, I mean, it's essentially our family, our, our, fam our, fam <laughs> our family has, um, Two income streams. You know, it's not like the farm is just trying to support our family, especially now that our family's growing and and, and, um, and yeah. we love working with other farms. Yeah. You know, that's what I love so much about Squash Blossom is that um is I love working with all the farms in the area because um it's yeah, it feels like more of a community. You can get kind of isolated out here, you know. Yes, yes. I, I feel like I have many farmers that the isolation is su is, is such uh so easy to happen. You know, we get our heads yeah. down and working, and this thing you know it's December. And we haven't talked to anybody who just been working. Yeah. And then we tell everybody that we're going to hang out in November, December, but then I don't know, <laughs> do we, do, do we really do it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, exactly. Exactly. Well, I'm, I'm so thankful Nino was able to come on and share about Squash Blossom. That was fantastic. Today's episode of the No-Till Market Garden podcast is brought to you by Certified Naturally Grown.
At the heart of sustainable ag is the belief that soil health and thriving ecosystems grow the very best food. Certified Naturally Grown is a grassroots certification program that recognizes direct market farmers using holistic methods and shows your customers that the products you bring to market are grown to the highest ecological standards. If you're looking for an affordable certification option that focuses on the thriving of local farms and foodways, you're going to want to check out CNG. Their peer-to-peer -peer inspections create opportunities for farmers to connect, exchange knowledge, and build regional support between growers, certify your produce, flowers, livestock, apiary, aquaponics, or mushroom operation today. Find out more at cngfarming.org. That's cngfarming.org. Today's episode is also brought to you by BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors are designed and built in Italy, where small-scale farming has been a way of life for generations. Discover the beauty of BCS on your farm with PTO-driven implements for soil working, shredding cover crops, spreading compost, mowing under fences, clearing snow, and much more, all powered by a single gear-driven machine that's tailored to the size and scale of your operation. We have been using a BCS tractor on our farm since 2014, and it has saved the day and leveled the workload more times than I can count and I find new ways to employ it every single season. To learn more, view sale pricing, or locate your nearest dealer, visit bcsamerica.com. That's bcsamerica.com. To learn more, view sale pricing, or locate your nearest dealer, visit bcsamerica.com. That's bcsamerica.com. All right, back to the show. Um, so you were saying earlier that, you know, you're, let's say you're doing unlimited salad mix for squash blossom. What are some of the crops that um, you're doing in your climate there? So, yeah, I wanted to get into this a little bit. So I pretty much, you know, I was thinking of this interview. And I was like, what do I really have that's, you know, different than any other like small scale vegetable growers? I, I don't really know. Um, we grow a lot of the same, you know, farmer's market you know, vegetables that you'd see on at a booth. Um, we grow about like 35 different crops, but how I kind of think about it is like, I have um, this winter, I did some work on Excel spreadsheet. And, and um, so I pretty much have 10 first tier crops, which is crops that I always have or try to have. Um, so those are like my heavy hitters, um, the crops that pretty much the customers always want, never can have enough of. And then I have uh, 10 second tier crops. So those are kind of like the seasonal um, seasonal crops that either I can only grow seasonally, like radishes, we can't grow radishes all summer here. Um, and that um, maybe people don't want all the time. People love radishes at first and then they get sick of them. And then have about 15 third tier crops that are like, sometimes I'll plant, you know, some cauliflower in the fall, but do I really need to? And does it really like, you know, does it, do I really need to grow cauliflower? Not really. Um, so, I've, so it's about 35 crops total throughout the year. And um, kind of how I base that is the, 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 the top tier, the, the 10 first tier crops, um, they need to, they kind of pay the bills. And um, so we're growing a lot of lettuce mix. We're growing a lot of carrots. We like to have carrots every week of the year. Um, yeah, I don't have the list on me, but pretty much those are trying to, those are pretty much like paying the paying the rent for the farm um so that's kind of how i how i see it trying to prioritize those those, those high value longer season or yeah longer production season uh crops well actually yeah it's it's having them around um but it's also really customer i mean the customer demand is really what um is is driving it right like what do what do customers always want what do i never we can sell enough of and a lot of times those happen to match up with you know the most profitable crops and this this year i did some work um on excel looking at um crop profit over week uh or crop potential profit over week so pretty much like you know you and it was really illuminating to see that some some crops are really not that profitable and you know sometimes um I don't know, I'm trying to get, I mean, broccoli is the infamous thing where it's kind of like, um, it takes a really long time. You can't, you know, can only fit so many heads of broccoli into one bed. And um, yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think of another example, um, but like, you know, if, if you can, if you, you know, we only have a certain uh, length of a season here. And if you can fit as many crops into that season, then, you know, you know, that's, that's how you make, that's how you make the, the farm uh, float essentially, you know? Yeah. I told you what you mean. Like you, you have those crops that are high, uh, 
I would say they have a long bro season, let's say lower value, right. but high demand, which everyone wants, but right. you know, I kind of skim those off, but, you know, like, you know, like right. cauliflower or something people might have demand for, but how long does the season produce that? Right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, sometimes I kind of feel a little bit like dirty talking about this, but um, I think it's really important, especially when you're on three quarters of an acre and you're really just trying to, um, you know, to make it all work. And so like, you're looking at all these different crops and it's like, okay, yeah, maybe I can squeeze in that crop, but um, you know, every bed is, is um, really valuable out here. And so like, you know, I did this, I did this Excel spreadsheet this winter and like, I'm looking at cilantro, cilantro. Um, it, it, it is pretty popular. So I'm still growing it, but you know, it takes pretty much 10 weeks to get, um, you know, cilantro bunches to market. And you, um, on this farm, I can only get so many, probably get 200 bunches out of a hundred foot bed, um, sell the bunches for, um, on here I have four bucks, but I really sell them for three bucks. And um, so I have a crop, crop profit potential of $77, $77 a week, which uh, really a hundred dollars is my per week is kind of my, my goal. And so I'm kind of looking at that and I don't know if it, yeah. I don't know. No, but those things are really important, especially like you said, if you're yeah. trying to maximize that three quarters of an acre, you have to look at all those numbers right. down to that because seven hundred dollars a week or hundred dollars a week, that's twenty five percent difference. That's a that's a that's it makes it makes a difference in the long term. Yeah, absolutely. And then, and these are you know what a lot of people don't realize. I mean, obviously, I'm talking to this audience, which are mainly farmers, but a lot of consumers or whatever don't realize that it's like you're you're paying money to farm right and so it's like it takes a lot of money you're you know you're hiring people you're buying seeds like even just like um you know having the electricity on costs money and so you really just want to make sure that you can you know pay yourself back for being under that hot sun and then also like i also like to grow a few fun crops and so like every year i'll grow a bed I have these two beds on the farm that are kind of like, I don't know, I always grow fun crops in them. And they're crops that I just really just grow. Like I'm not selling them at all. They're just bet they're just crops that I want to grow and learn about and 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 play with and eat and whatever. And so and um so I kind of <laughs> I kind of need other crops to support that, to support that venture, right? <laughs> You need the salad. Mix. You need the salad mix to like you know pay for the sorghum and tobacco that I grew last year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you had the balance. Yeah, exactly. How does your water availability and uh, how does that affect uh, what you produce and in your water source? How, how does all that fit in to the crops you choose? Yeah. So pretty much um, how it works is we're on, on an acequia system, and so that is. Um, so our water source is snow melt is is snow melt from the mountains that is held in a reservoir above our river valley, and then it's uh, released through the reservoir, and then um, it goes down to the river, and it's there are these diversions in the river, and each uh, an acequia um, has its own diversion, and so it's basically a it's a uh, uh, it's a you know ditch irrigation water distribution system and we get that water and then it fills up a pond on our property we have about a quarter acre pond and we hold that water because we might not get water we might get water you know once a month and that is our primary uh, irrigation source and we pump that through you know just a gas pump and um, it goes into a drip system and we grow everything on drip and so kind of getting back to my point is like every crop we plant you know we put drip on we put staples in we put hoops on, put row covers on, like every crop is a lot of effort. And so um, how it goes back to the water is like, I don't think the water necessarily um, dictates what crops we're growing, um, but it dictates like our, um, our bed flips and it dictates, you know, how we're treating the soil and it dictates, um, it takes a lot of things, not necessarily the crops that we're growing. Okay, okay. And maybe it's a good transition is that you said the water comes once a month. So it's like released from a from the from those holding po those holding ponds up in the valley, then it shows up once a month. I, how is that uh um how do you pronounce it? Yeah, I want to get it correct. Is it how do you pronounce the tin the tunnels? Asekia. Asekia. Okay. And and yeah, so it's um it comes from an Arabic word, al sakia which meant water carrier um, in Arabic. And it was a basically, um, 
So the, 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 the Pueblo Native Americans were irrigating out here and they were growing crops and they were doing some basic flood irrigation because that's how you, you know, it's the best way to really um, grow out here is flood irrigation if you have plenty of water. And then uh, the Spanish came in the 15, 1600s and they brought this technology that they got from the Moors when the Umayyad, uh, Umayyad Caliphate um, had control over Spain. They brought this Moorish Islamic technology to Spain and it's a technology, but it's very, it's very simple. You're basically just diverting water out of rivers and you're putting them through irrigation ditches. Where it gets more um, like uh, culturally based is that out here, there it's a form of governments. And so it's the oldest form of governments in the state of New Mexico. It's older than the United States of America. It predates when the, it was part of the Mexican government. And so this um, form of government, so each acequia is I kind of think of it as like a neighborhood association. So there's a, a commission, a comisión. And so each commission, there is a mayordomo and he is um, basically the boss who distributes the water. He's the one who's physically um, going and opening up different gates, uh, calling neighbors saying, hey, it's your time for water. You're gonna get water for an hour um, on this day. And um, so he's, he's the mayordomo. And then there's also a president uh, and a vice president, a secretary. And so a lot of the workings of the acequias are not only distributing the water, but um, doing um, you know fundraising work and trying to get the funds to update the infrastructure of the acequias. And um, so yeah, it's a really cool, complex, historic form of governance out here, but also like literally our life out here. You know, like out here, if you don't add water, nothing grows. Yeah. It seems like having the job of distributing the water to your neighbors would be like, just like, uh, well, no, like there's lots of stress involved with that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely, it can be very stressful. You have to be very diplomatic. And, you know, there are some stories of you know, guns being drawn and fights and, and stuff like that. You know, they say that like, uh, yeah, what is it? What? Waters for irrigating, whiskeys for drinking, something like that out here. <laughs> yeah, I'm just, uh, I, I'm really blown away about uh, the the amazing communal, uh, like the, the the connection of with with your neighbors around this water is is, is very beautiful. Uh, yeah. How, how do like how do the handle how do you handle these things when there's years of less water or more water? Is it like just based on need? Who needs that to save their crops? So what's how's that managed? Really, it's very complicated. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it varies, uh, it varies um, which watershed you're in, which uh, which um, which acequia you're on, how many water rights you hold, um, and it really, honestly, at the end of you know, so there are water rights that we uh, we have with our property. So everyone has to have water rights, and they get a certain number of acre feet, and so that's the legal framework that it works on. When there isn't water. Um, you know, it depends on where you live. We live in a valley that just went through a judic adjudication. And so are there, so that what that means is we have two uh, Native American Pueblos in our river valley. And um, in a really, really, really bad drought year when there's not enough water to go around, they can call priority. And so it doesn't necessarily matter what they're using that water for, but they can, they, they would take that water and they would be the only ones using that water. And the private, uh, the private irrigators in the valley wouldn't wouldn't have that ability. Um, so that's like our valley. But at the end of the day, really it matters on like what you're saying of your relations with your neighbors. You know, because all these people that are on the commission with you are your neighbors, um, and the different parciantes are neighbors together. And so it really depends on yeah your relationship with your neighbor, which is such a beautiful thing. Um, but there is the legal framework to go around that. And then there's also the actual availability of water. So it's all really complicated and it can get heated, um, but it's it's a really beautiful thing. Yeah, it does. And, and I, I feel like this, I, I'm going to do more a lot more research about this and read more into this. This is, is super interesting. Uh, yeah. The whole yeah, podcast, I could go about this. <laughs> yeah. And, and there are whole books written about it. There's whole, you know, it's a uh, right 500 year history. So you can get really a lot into it. Yeah. Well, so maybe we'll just do a quick little change up on here. Um, you are talking about earlier about a production. Um, how do you handle bed flips in this, in, in your environment? And kind of what's your soil type like? How, how do you manage all this? We are doing a low-till system. 
And so pretty much we have a VCS, that's our tractor. And um, we are, so with the water situation, like sometimes in June, you know, our, our humidity can be at like 5%, 6%, really dry and we're getting no rain. And so what we do is, um, so we have my, B, my BCS and how essentially I, I flip a bed is it's usually tarped in the summer. And I'll, and I'll tarp it after the previous crop. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll flow mow a crop and then I'll tarp it. And I'm really doing that to trap any moisture that's in the soil. And so like, if I was to just let that bed sit there under the hot summer sun, then uh, also we have bindweed everywhere on this farm. So the bindweed would grow without any water and then there'd be, you know, very little moisture. The, uh, the soil would, would just get really hard to work with. So we'll, we'll flail mow a crop, tarp it. And then even if it's only a few days and then we'll pull that tarp back. Um, we have this organic fertilizer pellets that we use um, depending on the crop, if it's in a tunnel, We'll use some gypsum. Um, we'll put a thin layer of compost on, and then we'll run a uh, power harrow with the BCS over that bed, and that really just kind of gets it, you know, nice and firm and um, fluffy enough to transplant into. We're using the paper pot transplanter, and that works most of the time with that system. And um, yeah, that's what that's pretty much what we're doing. There are some like some some variations on that, but that's like. The main the main thing we're doing so you're saying that it, if, if you left it open let it bare it would get like rock hard yeah it would get it would get rock hard but then also like it would just get so dry that the earthworms would move on down and i mean it would turn into sandy rock hard desert soil you know if you left that there for a month and then the bindweed would grow and then it would just be a harder situation to deal with and so if you can trap that moisture with the tarp Sometimes you could leave it there for a month and pull back the the soil. That's really nice. Okay, yeah. So try to preserve that moisture for the long term. Absolutely, yeah. Because yeah, totally. We don't we don't get rain in June, and so that's kind of been our strategy. And, and because of that, uh, the, the access to water. Uh, you said you've been doing is transplanting the paper pot your main way of of of, of growing, or do you do a lot of dread seeding as well? Um, we do we do it we do a little bit of everything. Um, we do the paper pots for like our um our lettuces scallions um that's pretty much it um and then we're using direct seeding for you know radishes arugula spicy greens bok choys um things like that and then we do we we went we went we bought the paper pot and we went a little bit too hard on the paper pot and then it, you just have to realize that um the advantages and disadvantages and so we have now transferred to a lot of doing the 200 cells plastic cells and um you know we do still do 72s for our kales and our chards and our peppers and, and things like that and um there's i have a real appreciation for just like hand transplanting and and doing that um but you know as much as much salad and lettuce as we do um the paper pot is huge for us yeah it, it sounds like it uh and it, maybe maybe this is kind of uh, on the same line um in, so you said earlier you're doing uh, a lot of tunnel production as well. Uh, is, does, does that yeah. tarping and, and that trying to hold the moisture as well, does, does the tunnel itself maybe hold moisture in as well? Does it help with that? Yeah, it doesn't. I've had some trouble with, um, you know, with doing bed flips in the tunnels in the summer um, or even in the winter sometimes. Like in the spring, you know, you go out in the, and outside the soil is really nice. It has some nice residual moisture from the winter in the tunnel. If you don't have anything growing in it, if you're not irrigating – then it's it's rock hard it's bone dry and it's really hard to work with um this winter we invested in the overhead sprinklers um for the caterpillar tunnels and so that's i think going to be really helpful um because last year you know we had peas in a tunnel and uh we flail you know they, they finished in june mid-june and then we flail mowed them and flail mowing's awesome flail mowing peas is one of the most satisfying things ever because it just like you have like six foot of like peas and vines and it just like makes into this awesome mulch. And then we probably we didn't flip it for two weeks and it got too dry in there because, um, yeah, and it was really hard to work with and um, you couldn't even in. Yeah, it was it was kind of a nightmare. And so. I have these sprinklers and I think it'll be really nice to be able to add water to like that situation 
if I flow mode the peas, watered it, and then um, either just left it to break down for a little bit or uh, tarped it or done something and then planted it into there. But um, yeah, and and I just wanted to say like, yeah, so our soils when we started out were 1.5% um, organic matter. Okay. Sandy, uh, sandy loam. And they're, they're really nice when they have some, when they have some moisture and water them. Um, they're really quite nice, but when they get dry, it's just a, kind of a sandy, yeah, sandy situation. And um, in one of our high tunnels, just through intensive cropping and even doing some summer uh, cover crops, we got that up to 5% organic matter. And then um, the caterpillar tunnels, we got that up to 3% organic matter. And out in the field, in some places, we got it up to 3% organic matter. And um, that's pretty good for three years. I'm pretty proud of that. And especially out here, so the NRCS claims that every 1% organic matter, you can hold 20,000 gallons of water. Um, so, you know, in an area where water is super important, that's... You know, hundreds of thousands of gallons of water that you're holding in those soil aggregates and have that much change in only you know under five years. That's pretty impressive. Um, are you, uh, to increase your organic matter that quickly, are you also adding compost to your beds? Um, yeah, we did, we did a large, we did large applications of compost right when we got here. Um, but compost is kind of a hard thing in our area. Um, it's very low quality and it's very expensive. Interesting. Um, and in 20, you know, 2020, pre prior, pre prior to 2020, it wasn't that expensive, but now it's got prohibitively expensive and it's just really not that good quality. Um, it's very mulchy. And I think a lot of it is because we live in an area that doesn't have a lot of natural resources. I mean, there are, of course, it's a very beautiful area, but we don't have, um, we don't have forestry resources. We don't have an ocean with seafood, you know, uh, resources, and we don't have um you know we don't have a lot of uh dairy so we don't have a lot of manure and stuff like that and um and so you know there aren't a lot of pretty much most of the compost is made from uh chipped uh, wood chips from invasive trees mixed with whatever people can get their hands on and so it's just kind of mulchy and not very good but um we've used it and um, I think our strategy has been to just kind of raise that organic matter at first. And then um, and then we've kind of gotten a good place. And then even just growing crops out here will increase the organic matter. Gotcha. Inter well, maybe a quick little transition from there. Um, in this, in your climate, in your environment, what kind of pests are you seeing predominantly, um, both, you know, animals and uh, insects? What's kind of the major thing you're dealing with? Yeah, so we don't have deer out here. We don't have um maybe they are worse like uh pests we deal with is gophers and um gophers and mice in in the nursery um we have we definitely have pests out here it depends on the year but i don't think it's anything like that bad maybe i've just gotten used to it i mean we have squash bugs that make it almost impossible to grow cucurbits in the middle of the summer um, that's probably like the worst thing. I mean, I mean, then you just don't grow cucurbits, but I really like cucumbers. So that kind of sucks. Um, you know, we have flea beetles that are pretty bad in the early spring. I haven't seen any this year. Um, we have these, um, things called harlequin bugs. I think they have them a lot in the South. Uh, do you know what those are? No, I don't. What, what are those? They're, they're, um, they're a true bug and they look, they're orange and black and they look, um, they're kind of rectangular-ish. They look like a stink bug, but they're black okay. and orange. And what they do is they come out in June and they go after brassicas. So they go after kale. They grow after, you know, cauliflowers, all those large brassicas. They don't really go after the arugula and the baby greens. Um, and some years they can be pretty bad. Like they'll decimate, they'll decimate a kale planting. Um, but a lot of that is just timing. You know, you just have another secessions coming on or, um, you know, insect netting, although insect netting only works up to a certain point with, you know, four foot high, uh, kales. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you know, a lot of it, you know, I feel like there's nothing that makes it, um, too hard to grow out here. A lot of it is just strategy and lots of plantings and, 
and being on top of it. One thing I have heard of is grasshoppers um, getting really bad. So we have grasshoppers all around. Um, but I've heard from like my fellow farmers that in 2014 here, there was a huge grasshopper, um, whatever you call it. And um, basically they grasshoppers decimate everything. They'll just eat everything. And um, I had some friends of friends up in Colorado who in 2021, 20, 22, I forget the years, they were fighting grasshoppers so bad that they just had to call it quits there for the middle of the summer. They were just eating everything under insect netting, under row covers and tunnels, tomatoes, peppers, arugula, kale, everything. And um, I think what it has to do is you have, you're surrounded by pastures and then you get these boom and bust systems. Um, and when, when you get dry, you know, you get a big, big, big boom of grasshoppers and then the pastures dry out. And if you're surrounded by really large scale pastures, you know, they come for the yummy stuff. Yeah. I I've heard out West and those swarms have been like horrendous. I've heard stories of like eating paint off of buildings and <laughs> insane type of like, yeah, I can imagine how rough it could get out there with those. Yeah. But I haven't experienced that and, you know, I'm sure I will at some point. Um, but that's like, honestly, why we're diversified, right? You know, we get, we get these hailstorms that I get sketched out about, you know, about once a year, we get maybe a hailstorm, even if it's not that bad. Um, but you know, if you're, if you're a farm that's growing a lot of greens and you get a bad hailstorm, how do you deal with that? You know? Yeah, Hopefully, no, totally. You got some good carrots coming on. Um, or like, you know, sometimes if it's a really rainy year, I feel like there's a lot of hailstorms. I'll keep shade cloth out in the field. I have these like 25 foot wide shade cloths that I use on tunnels sometimes. And I'll put them across, I'll, I'll kind of stage them across like my green sections. And if I feel like there's a big rainstorm or hailstorm coming, I'll, I'll come and just kind of peel that, that shade cloth over the greens, you know, just for that, whatever hour or two, if I feel like there's a hailstorm and I had a big hailstorm in 22 and, um, or in 20, 2021. And I just did that. And we had, you know, pea size hail for about 45 minutes and I had no damage because of that. Everything was covered. So it's having that, uh, having things set up ahead of time so that you can yeah. cover or can, and, you know, that only works if you have things set up and it only works if you're right there on the farm, you know, if you're a market and that happens, you're screwed. But, um, <laughs> you know, I guess that's why you're diversified. And like, if you do get, you know, a hailstorm, then you just plant again. You got to wait 45, 45 days before you can get anything else, I guess. Yeah. Well, I guess maybe that's a good transition to the next question. So moving forward over the next few years, what are some of your personal goals for the farm, either financial or just to say personal? What's What do you see yourself heading in the next few years? I mean, we had a baby last year and that was kind of a, you know, you hear it from people, but once you have a baby, you kind of like want to spend time with your family more and just kind of like, you know, there are times where I would just do st stupid shit out in the field. I'd be like, oh, I'm just going to do this for an hour. And then like right now I'm like, but do I need to do that? Or can I just not do that? Well, like if I don't do that, will things be OK? Most of the time it's yes. Um, so I feel like just getting a better perspective on the farm and family balance life. And um, also like since 2019, my farm has only got smaller and every year it's been more profitable. And so just trying to, of course, there's going to be a, you know, a, a climax to that, but really just trying to get smarter in terms of um, plantings and, um, you know, workload and, um, and things like that. And, and just profitability where you can do less and be better off. And um, yeah, it sounds like trying to find and pursuing even better balance uh, in, in your, in your farm life. Exactly. That's fantastic. Well, I mean, our last question, uh, if you have something, we'd like to have an open platform for our guests to speak on what's on their farmer's heart. If you had something, cool. If you don't, no big deal. But is there anything over the last few months or years that you want to uh, let people know about that, uh, that's been on your heart? Yeah, I don't know. This is kind of a silly topic, but um, I feel like I have you know, and maybe I'm preaching the choir here because a lot of people are, are are small scale farmers, but I've kind of gotten some slack from from people over the years for using a lot of materials on the farm for tarps and row covers and insect netting. And, you know, you look at my farm and sometimes it's especially now in the spring, it's all row covers. And I just feel that like, you know, 
what we're doing is we're using the smallest amount of resources to gain the most um to, to produce to produce the most nutritious organic beneficial food for humans for plant life and um you know these are all reusable um materials and i feel like um you know we're on like three quarters of an acre and the good that we're pulling out of three quarters of an acre is really incredible and um you know it's all a balance right and um so that's kind of like sometimes it goes over the thoughts that go over my head i'm like yeah, sometimes I look out here and it's just a bunch of like synthetic fabrics, but you know, the amount, the, the amount of water that we're using, meaning, you know, if we were flood irrigating, we'd be using a lot more water and the precision of, um, you know, the drip tape. And, you know, if you, if, especially here in the high desert, if we weren't using any of these things, we'd have fresh food for maybe a month, a half month and a half out of the year. And the good that we can do with these materials, especially for, you know, growing local economies and um, supporting community at the farmer's market, I think is well worth it as long as we're, um, you know, really responsible with these materials. No, I totally agree with you, especially when a small scale, like you said, precision agriculture, you know, that row cover, you're going to use that year after year after year. And I've seen some commercial uh, production where they come through, put on row cover, and then just bail it up and throw it away after every season. That's just how it's used. Totally. And that's, and you know, and, and I feel another thing was that, like, I feel like farmers have the, um, you know, they have the, uh, how do I put it? They have the high, they're supposed to be held to the highest standards. And for a good reason, because a lot of us, you know, throughout the whole country, the whole world are, are literally like on the land, but we have the highest standards, but sometimes we're on the bottom of the societal and economic ladder. And, um, you know, it's really easy to critique somebody for using landscape fabric, even though they've used it for five years and they reuse it, but then they can go out to the store and buy some strawberries, you know, and then that was yeah. growing on thousands of acres of plastic that was just used for one one year and thrown in the landfill. So I feel like, you know, Farmers are an amazing, amazing bunch, especially the whole world over where, um, you know, small scale farmers are the norm in the world. And, um, you know, women farmers produce most of the calories in the world. And um, yeah, I feel, I don't know, I, I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but we hold an amazing responsibility. And um, yeah, I stand by what I'm doing 100%. No, 100%. I also feel like as small scale producers, we'll always seek the way to be most sustainable with our resources because you know every cent we save is a cent in our pocket as you said it's so low on the so i feel again like, yeah, the more small producers you have are just gonna manage those resources so much better than uh anyone who you know doesn't have to think about it in that way absolutely so those are my those are my two cents matt that was a great one i i really appreciate you you bringing that up that's something that's a lot of people need to need, need to talk more about uh i really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to sit down and chat with me and Nina as well to share uh, not only about your farm, but also about Squash Blossom. It really means a lot to me. I know our our listeners will really appreciate it. Cool. Well, it's been, um, you know, I'm humbled and thanks for having me. And it's been an awesome conversation. Oh, Matt. Well, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. You have a great day. Thanks, Alex. A huge thanks again to Nina and Matt for taking time out of their busy schedules to sit down and chat with me about all the work they're doing up there in northern New Mexico. If you want to learn more about them, check out their website or their social media. Thanks a lot for listening, y'all, and have a great day. Hey, you all, Farmer Jesse here, just jumping in real quick to catch you up on some of what we have going on. It's spring here in Kentucky, so basically we're just planting our faces off, but we wanted to alert you to the No-Till Growers YouTube channel if you've not found that yet. It is back up and running again for another season of videos. There are new guides for onion, tomato, pepper, and spinach production. There is a new interplanting video up this week. Just dozens and dozens of very intensive breakdowns and farm tours and etc. Go over to YouTube and search for No-Till Growers and subscribe. Uh, we've got those videos plus a great forum at notillgrowers.com plus new podcasts coming and all of that is supported by just a handful of people who listen and watch. If you're a longtime listener or just a new listener and you've never donated or joined the Patreon page or bought a shirt or a book or anything like that, or if you just have not in a while, consider kicking in. Our yearly budget is less than a quarter of what some shows cost to produce a single episode. As that grows, we can grow the amount of work we put out there, the quality, the nerdiness, the variety, all of it. So if you loved this podcast episode or anything else we're doing, 
and you have the means, there are several ways to support us at notillgrowers.com, like a hat or a book or merch, or even better, become a yearly or monthly patron at patreon.com slash notillgrowers, where not only may you get discounts on our stuff, but at a certain level, or if you just bump up from one level to another, you get a shout out on the show. So big shout outs this week to Cloister Farm and Livestock Co., Rob Soma, Sean at All About the Garden, Joseph Sanguinetti, Bill Altman, Ian at Grindstone Farms, Danny Rodriguez, Alex Savatsky, Pear Tree Hill Farm, Steve Burr, Stephanie and Alex, Stephen Smith, Jason Ruel, Ojai Roots, Scott Harris, Earth Care Farmer Jane Murner Cynical, Tony Lopez, Clément, Judson Taylor, Grown Up Farm, Bob and Ann Patton of Hexhamshire Organics, Jared Kirst at Rivendell Farms, Dan Brisebois, Jay McCombs, Tim Baldwin, Steve Larson, Fiona and Donnie of Firefly Farm, and Jen Lawrence. Huge shout out to everyone who supports our show in whatever way that you can. That Patreon page is the lifeblood of our work, so we hope you will hop on board. And that's it for me. Thanks, y'all. We'll see you next week. Bye.